It's good to see you all. Thank you for coming. We are in for a treat today. I'm talking about a very challenging subject, and a lot of people will come with preconceived ideas on where they stand on the subject. So what I want you to do, if that's okay, to start off with, is just put aside any preconceived ideas you've had before you came in. If you didn't have any, that's even better. Okay, so we can start from scratch. But if you had preconceived ideas about creation, evolution, and that sort of thing, put them aside, because I want you to be open-minded and see about this new information that I'm going to bring to you that will hopefully help you. Now, before we start, I am John Harris. I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am here to talk to you about a subject I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself before I start. Uh, I'm John Harris. I'm founder of Creation Science UK. I'm also head of Living Waters Europe. Living Waters Agency here in Europe is responsible for evangelism. We do a lot of evangelism, street evangelism, and we record them on camera. So if you want to see how we do that, you can check it out on our website as well, which I'll give you the information later if you wanted to. But I'm also managing director of a medium-sized company and been there for about 20 years. My training is in computer science. I develop systems, software programming development for large companies. I use about half a dozen languages to make this possible, and I've been doing it for a long, long time. I've spent a lot of time studying creation, what the Bible says, and how that compares with science. And I've also spent a lot of time looking into evolution and what evolutionists say and how that compares with science. So I studied this subject, and I am not kidding you or exaggerating, thousands of hours. I've put my entire life into this. I wanted to know the truth, and I wanted to make sure that people know the truth as well. I'm assuming that the majority, if not all of you, are born-again Christians. But if you're not, that's okay. If you're an atheist, that's all the better. And I don't mind being challenged later on, so if you have some questions, please write them down on a piece of paper and ask me later. Please pay attention to the screens because there's going to be loads of information on the screen. And if you don't pay attention to the screen and the references and the scientific claims I'm bringing to you, you may not be so equipped at asking the question because I could have answered the question. My intention today is to be theologically sound and scientifically accurate, okay? So... If your intention is to glorify God and glorify Jesus and see that God's word is not twisted, turned, or changed, then you're in the right meeting here, okay? But if you think I'm making some claims that are not accurate, it's unlikely because they're all going to be on the screen. Please challenge me later. That's why you got your pen and paper. First of all, those people who say evolution is true and creation is false either don't understand evolution or don't understand creation or both. That's a bold claim right there. There is a misunderstanding there because people who tell you that do not understand what they're saying when they make a claim like that. Evolutionists think that creation is simply appeal to the God of the gaps. Basically, if they don't understand something, they say God did it. Let, let us be fair here. A lot of us have done this. I don't understand how it works, so therefore God did it, and I'm okay with that. That's okay, but I'm here today to equip you so that you can answer those questions to people who come and tell you things like that. Most of the time when people come to me and say creation is false, the first thing that comes to my mind is that you have no idea what creationists are saying. Sadly, many creationists don't know what they're saying. Okay, so we're going to clarify that and fix this hopefully once and for all. And that's why today we're going to talk about creation, evolution, and the different views. What scientific evidence is there to defend your case? Hey, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, evolution is true or what defense have you got for creation being true? What defense have you got for that? How do you know if uh, Genesis is accurate and right? What would you tell them when they say, defend your case? Did God create everything? Well, how do you know? Defend your case scientifically, please, sir. How would you do that? Okay, so hopefully I'm going to equip you today to be able to answer questions like that. Some believe the earth is old and some believe the earth is young, like 6,000 years ago. Now, you might have already views about the subject. I'm going to just show you the views on those subjects, and then I'm going to let you make your mind up when you leave which camp you want to belong to. But you've got to be right about this, okay? Just because you believe in something, it doesn't make it true. Agreed? It's got to be true. You can't just say it's true. It's got to be true, all right? There is such thing as absolute fact. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit fast because I haven't got... 24 hours like I need normally to cover this subject. You can watch some of my other talks on the internet, but I'm going to try to be as quick as I can. I've got a lot to cover. 
So, some reject evolution, some reject creation, and some mix the two together without knowing much about either one of those. So, who is right? Well, who is wrong and how would you decide? In fact, you might have already decided, but how did you decide that? How did you know? How did you know the differences? So, basically, there are two main views. Either creation is true, in other words, the creation worldview is true, in which case God created everything with purpose, meaning, and intelligence. He's the boss and he makes the rules, okay? Or the worldview of evolution is true, in which case it's one big cosmic accident. All of this is meaningless and purposeless, or it's whatever purpose or meaning you want to give it. Some say that life came from another planet, but we will dismiss those because that's just simply evolution that's shifted to another planet. Yeah, okay, so it's evolution apparently happened somewhere else and came here. That's the same as believing that evolution happened here, just shifting the problem to another planet. Or also we'll ignore those who say we aren't really all here, we just think we are here. No point of addressing people who are not all there. <laughs> okay, so we're essentially down to two possibilities, creation or evolution. Well, let's see about each group what they believe. So the uh, evolutionists would say about three and a half billion years ago, life started from natural processes. About 4.6 billion years ago, give me a break. If you're here and you've got exact figures, don't tell me it wasn't 4.6, it was 4.56 or something. So give me slack with half a billion years, okay? Earth is formed from natural processes and about 13.75, give or take a few billion years, it changes all the time. The Big Bang occurred. After this, stars formed from natural processes. Well, on the other hand, those who read the plain reading of the Bible have a different view. Let me explain to you what I mean by saying plain reading of the Bible. If you knew nothing about evolution and the age of the earth, and you had nothing but the Bible to work with, and I put you in a desert for five years, and I told you to keep reading that 25 times, when you come back, you will not tell me that evolution was true, and you will not tell me that the world is billions of years old. I'm going to show you in a minute why people would say that. But I'm telling you this is the plain reading of the Bible. I'm going to tell you in a minute why it is. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that. Okay? So keep your mind open so that you can see all the facts. I'm not interested in what people believe. I'm interested in what the Bible is saying. Or at least what people who read the Bible are saying about the subject. Okay. So it all happened about 6,000 years or so ago. Again, I said I'll explain that in just a minute. About one and a half thousand years later, there was a global flood. That's about 4,400 years ago. And the Bible says that he created uh, us in his image. The closest it comes to mentioning evolution in chapter 1 is when it says that everything will bring forward according to its kind. And it mentions that ten times. Genesis chapter 1, ten times it mentions that fact. The difference in timing between those two beliefs is about three million times. And that is a huge difference. And you can't get both to be right. One of those guys is wrong. That's why Christians come along and say, whoa, 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 we'll mix the two together. This is where the view comes from. I'm going to show you how they mix them together so that you're informed, at least be informed about what you're believing. And if I had a chart that did this to scale, my charge for evolution would reach from here to Canada. Okay, so that's the big difference between the two views. And some mix them together, so that's where the view comes from. So why do they say the plain reading of the Bible promotes a 6,000-year-old earth? Why do they say that? Well, it's easy. Check this out. In Genesis chapter 1 to 11, it says, On day one, God created the earth and light, and he called it good after that. On day two, he divided the water above from the water below. On day three, waters gathered, dry land appeared, as well as a vegetation, plants, and fruit-bearing trees. It was double good. That's what God called it. Day four, he created sun, moon, and stars, and he called it good. Day five, sea creatures, that's fish, and flying animals in the sky, these are birds, and he called it good. And on day six, all land animals, the bugs, insects, and Adam and Eve were created, and God called it good. And on the seventh day, he, God rested, blessed his creation, and he called it, what did he call it? He called it very good. Okay, right on the last day, he called it very good. Then came the fall of man, then comes the global flood, and then the Tower of Babel. All where the different languages have started, what the Bible tells us. And that summary of Genesis 1 to 11, that, then comes Abraham, Moses, Joshua, etc. There it is. That's your summary there, right there. And this is what the contention is all about. I can talk about each one of those at least for an hour, at least. And I'll show you scientifically how accurate that could be. 
I'm not going to do that today because you don't have nine hours. So we're going to skip through a lot of this stuff. So when did all this happen? That's the key question here. From day six, the Bible gives us the genealogy from Adam all the way back to Jesus. That's 2,000 years ago. And this is important because it helps us work out some dates. So here are some dates. Seth was born when Adam was 130. Enos was born when Seth was 105. Canaan was born when Enos was 325, and so on. And the Bible is full of this all the way, from the beginning all the way to Jesus. And it tells us that in some places, in case some people were not very sure, it gives us exact numbers. Like in Jude, it says Enoch was the seventh from Adam. So you couldn't fit in millions of generations between that. It's actually giving you exact numbers. Okay, so from that you can work out the number. And believe it or not, I went through this myself a few years ago. These are exactly my notes. And it's not really hard to do, to go through this. And in case you thought only I would be mad enough to do something like this, about 400 years ago, Archbishop James Usher dedicated his life calculating this in the 17th century. And you know what he came up with? Dedicated his life. That's a long time usually, right? Extensively he did this, and this is what he came up with. He's calculated the genealogy all the way from Adam, and he worked out that the world was created at 4004 BC on the 23rd of October. Now, if you are amazed about this, if you are amazed that he can come up with such an accurate response, well, you'll be even more amazed to hear that he worked out what time Adam was created. Okay, now, I'm not sure that you could be that accurate. Okay, I'm not sure it could be that accurate. Now, I don't know whether Adam was created at 9 a.m., but I know for sure he was created before 6 p.m. because the Bible says Adam was created before Eve. <laughs> okay, you're paying attention. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right, so altogether, that's apparently 6,000 years ago. If you hold this view, then you believe in a literal 24-hour day theory. That means each day in Genesis is literally a 24-hour period. But isn't the world supposed to be millions, if not billions of years old? Isn't that the case? Well, if you're a Christian and you believe the world is billions of years old, look, I'm helping you out here. If you believe that the world is billions of years old, well, then it had to be squeezed between those days, days one and five, because the dates from Adam is pretty much a done deal. We've got the dates that goes from Adam all the way to Jesus, so it's really hard to do that. So if you're a sound Christian and you really want to fit in billions of years, you have to do it this way. You have to go between days one and five. Basically, each one of those theories, these are the theories that you have to believe in, each one of those theories attempts for a Christian to add in millions or billions of years. I, I don't have time to explain it. Trust me, I started, and I've got the answers. I can tell you what they are if you ask me later. But we're not going to sit here going through every one of those. Trust me, these are the possible answers. There's a few more, but this for now is going to do it. They're all bad but not as bad as believing in theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is really bad because it affects all of Genesis 1 to 11, all of it, unlike the other one that affects the first five days. It affects the flood and the Tower of Babel, but the worst is by far deism. I don't know if you guys know what deism is, but if you're a Christian and I don't care how liberal you are in your views, you can't adopt deism. So I'm gonna tell you what deism is. It's basically the idea that God created the world and then stop getting involved with the universe. He no longer intervened with his creation. He let it be. The Bible is not inspired. Uh, man is centered, and therefore you can't have any revelation from God. Jesus is not the only way, the truth, and the life. You can't get redemption from, any other, uh, from, uh, from Jesus. So basically, God left it for us to do whatever we want. Okay, so you have to be pretty strong. Well, you can't be a Christian and have that view because it just contradicts everything in the Bible. There are many good scientists who've written about the subject, and you can get it there. If you want to hear more about the subject on how old is the earth, you can listen to one of my talks on the subject that says, how old is the earth? Okay, you can go on the internet and check it out and see it for yourself, where I cover this detail both theologically and scientifically. Right, now let's briefly look at theistic evolution. The second worst option, okay, the first one is deism, now the second worst option, which is theistic evolution. Those who hold this position say evolution is real, in other words, it did really happen, but that it was set in motion by God. Evolution occurred, as biologists describe it, but under the direction of God. That means, if you hold this view, Genesis 1 to 11 is nothing more than a myth, a parable, a story, an allegory, that sort of thing, instead of historically true. 
Okay, that's where it comes from. Christians reject this view generally on grounds that it sounds too atheistic. Well, the evolutionists reject this view because it sounds too religious. Okay, so whichever camp you belong to, you will get it. All right, no one will be happy with you, neither the atheist nor the Christian. Everybody tends to not agree with both of those sides, and you will have an argument at your hand. I'm not sure how good you can defend this position and be equipped and stand firm in your ability to answer those questions. You know, the Bible says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. Well, I'm not sure if you hold this view, you're going to be able to do this very effectively. But it's up to you. But some of you say, well, I'm comfortable with the idea. I seem to, I can make everything fit in my head. I like the way this works. Okay. But it took an atheist, a philosopher, a, science, a philosopher of science to point out the obvious in believing in this. This is what he said. The problem that the biological evolution poses for natural theologians is the sort of God that the Darwinian version of evolution implies. The evolutionary process is rife with happenstance, which means coincidence, contingency, which means by chance and uncertainty, incredible waste, death, pain, and horror. Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. I hope that shocked you a little bit. You can't argue with that guy. You really couldn't. Okay, it's pretty strong words, and I think he may be right. I'll leave you to decide that. Even Darwin acknowledged this. He said, thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted objects which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. So Darwin is saying, man came about through death and suffering, through all the pain that people go through, the death that they went through, this is how Adam came into the scene. Darwin wasn't blind. He saw that there were death and suffering, so he connected those two together, and he came up with the idea. Well, if evolution is true, then death is the hero of the plot, because through death, suffering came Adam. Death was necessary to bring Adam to the scene. Now, I want, to, I want you to think about this, because it should really challenge you in your theological belief and what you're telling your friends about where sin came from and what Jesus came to do. If that's true, then death existed before Adam. That means death is not the last enemy God promised to destroy in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Seeing it produces such wonderful creatures, why would it be an enemy? If Adam was an ape man, then we were not created in God's image unless ape man is in God's image. Adam never sinned before bringing death in the world. Therefore, Jesus never needed to come to undo what Adam did, which is Romans 5. And therefore, Jesus did not need to die. If Genesis is false, the gospel is false, the crucifixion is false, the Bible is unnecessary, Christianity is false. I'm here to show you how to defend your faith, okay? That's not doing a good job so far, right? Okay, so not only that, but... Even though God called his creation good six times on the days of his creation and then very good on day seven, even though God says he hates death, and I, give, I love God, loads of verses to defend that, he actually made Adam and Eve celebrate their creation on millions of years of death and suffering. All these bones that are underneath those layers, that's what they were standing on when God revealed creation and they were celebrating their creation. You would hardly call that good. All this happened within the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Right, so the consequence is just unbelievable. If Genesis 1 to 11 is a myth, then why did Jesus quote from it? Why did he do that? And refer to it as real history. In case you didn't know, the covenant of marriage is a myth because it was ordained in Genesis 1 to 11. Jesus referred to Adam and Eve to justify marriage. Well, if Adam and Eve were a myth, then so is marriage. Jesus referred to the blood of Abel and the prophets to explain God's judgment and wrath that's coming to this generation. If Abel is a myth, because he's in Genesis 1 to 11, then so is God's wrath. Jesus referred to Adam and Eve as the beginning of creation. Well, if Genesis is a myth, then Jesus is either confused or he's lying about the beginning, or he doesn't know about the beginning, because 
he referred to it as the beginning. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So if the flood is a myth in Genesis, then why is Jesus referring to his second coming to an event that's a myth? Wouldn't that make his second coming a myth? Okay, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the last Adam, but if the first Adam doesn't exist or was a myth, then so is Jesus, who's supposed to be the last Adam. If all this space is a myth, if everything we believe in theologically is based on a myth, well, that makes the entire Bible false. It really does. This is Richard Dawkins. This is what he calls Christians who believe in both creation and evolution or mixes them together. This is what he calls them. And I want you to pay attention. He's not a daft man. Okay, that man, we, I know he comes up with stuff and we don't agree with them. He doesn't get everything wrong. So let's see what he says about and that. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it. God doesn't exist. Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy. Um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. And I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity, and I think I realized that at the age of about 16. Okay, some strong words he said there. He said, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. It's pretty harsh. If that's what he is saying, then what are people saying about you? So, theistic evolution can't really be the answer, right? So, what is the answer? This leads me to a very important point, and I'm going to uh, hopefully cover this uh, very quickly here. Did you know that there are some Christians who actually think that Noah's flood, it was a local event? Hey, listen, I've got a hard time making people believe that there was a flood, never mind a global flood. But those people who do are insisting, some of them at least, that it was a local flood. So let me correct that very quickly, if possible. If it was a local flood, why was the ark so big? It took, him over, it took Noah over 100 years to build. He put a lot of animals in it and stayed in it for over a year. If it was a local flood, why did God just tell Noah to move? That would be much easier, right? If it was a local flood, how did the water cover the highest mountains, according to uh, the Bible? Water is fluid, you know. It does spread out a little, a little. Why did he have to take birds with him on the ark if it was a local flood? The birds just fly. Okay, just get them to fly somewhere else. You can get birds flying across continents. And finally, why did God say it will never happen again, which was the whole purpose of having the rainbow, right? I'm not sure if you're aware, if you open up your news TV, I think you'll realize that there are many local floods everywhere. So was God not keeping his promise or did he mean something else? Well, according for a creationist, well, he never said there was going to be no local flood. He said there was going to no, there's not going to be another global flood to destroy the earth. But be aware, although God promised that he won't destroy the world with water again, God did tell us that one day he will destroy it with fire. And here it is, 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. There's your big bang right at the end there. Just got it the wrong way around. And the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. So yes, he will destroy the world one day again, but he won't use water, he will use fire. So let that be a warning to us, that these are the, straight out of the gospel. So what's the big deal with the creationists? What's the big deal with these guys, all right? Can they not see the millions of dead fossils in the ground? Is that what they cannot see? Are they deliberately ignoring this fact? What about this one? What about the layers in the rock? Can creationists actually not see their layers in the rock? What are they doing? Are they just turning a blind eye? Can't they see the millions of years in the, in the rock layers? What about understanding radiometric dating or carbon dating? Are creationists really having problems understanding this principle and just saying, no, we don't believe in it? What are they, what are they doing? Why are they turning a blind eye to all these facts? What about this one? What about biology? Are they denying that DNA do actually mutate? All right, so are they not seeing all this stuff? And what about astronomy or the billions of stars that are billions of light years away, right? Now, bearing in mind the speed of light, 
how did billions of light years of these starlights come to us? All right, so you gotta have to answer all these questions. Who cannot see all this? That is why it's so challenging. That is why it's a big problem for Christians to answer those questions, and you better be good at it. Seriously, you better be good at this. Oh, what's going on? Why can't we just see the evidence and come to a conclusion that satisfies everybody? Why can't we just do that? You see, the evidence is not the problem, that's why. Everybody's interpreting it the way they want. So it's the interpretation that's the problem, not the evidence. So the creationists and evolutionists are looking at the same thing, the same evidence. The creationists look at the evidence and say, they claim that it proves God. The evolutionist looks at the evidence and claim it proves evolution. Why are they coming up with different conclusions? Well, if you're thinking to yourself that evolutionists are using good core science, whereas creationists are going around and saying God did it, if that's what you're really thinking, man your way out. And you need to get in touch. You need to find out what they're really saying so that you can stand firm in response to those things. They tell us that creation and creationists have no place in science. Have you not come across this? People come along and they say, you have no place in science because you're a creationist. Well, is that true? If you believe that, if you actually believe that as a creationist, you can't do good science, I'm going to shock you. Okay, I'm going to shock you just right now. Watch this. Most foundational scientific discoveries were made by scientists who were creationists. Some may not have been Christians, I admit that, but nonetheless, they were creationists. Here's a quick short list. There are some amazing famous people here. Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, um, not to mention Isaac Newton, known as the greatest and most influential scientist who ever lived. Did you know that Isaac Newton was born in Lincolnshire? That's good, right? Hey, this is amazing town here. Incredible. Let's not forget this guy. Yeah, John Harris, he's amazing, right? Well, that's either not me or I'm really old. Okay, I'm not that old. Scientists like George Cuvier, the Matthew Murray, known as the Pathfinder of the Sea, a principle he got directly from the Bible. If you want to know what that is, listen to one of my talks on Is the Bible Scientifically Accurate? online. Thomas Chalmers, Michael Faraday, Samuel Morse, the inventor of Morse code, Charles Babbage, the inventor of the first mechanical computer, Richard Owen, a paleontologist who coined the word dinosaur. He coined the word, the creationist, coined the word dinosaur, which actually means terrible reptile or fearfully great reptile. Uh, also people like uh, James Joule, known for the first law of thermodynamics, the idea that matter and energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Uh, Gregor Mendel is known as the father of modern genetics. The father of modern genetics, a creationist? What is going on here? Louis Pasteur discovered the law of biogenesis. Do you know what the law of biogenesis is? That life does not come from non-life. You need life to create life. So when an evolutionist comes and tells you that life can be generated on its own from non-life, well, they're breaking the law of biogenesis. It's been around for um, a couple of hundred years. The idea that life can spontaneously generate or come from nowhere, spontaneously generate, comes from the ancient Greek who believed that the goddess Gaia could make life spontaneously from stones. Now, what is the consequence of all this? If you believe that life spontaneously can generate from nothing, you've gone back thousands of years when they used to believe in idols and goddesses. Uh, William Calvin, he was known for all these discoveries. Too much to read through. James Maxwell, known for about a dozen discoveries. He did the durable color photograph. Uh, John Lemming, he was known for the vacuum tube and the diode. And this guy is also famous for left-handed rule for electric motor. All of those creationists. Listen, you know when all this took off? It took off in the 1600s. You know why all these discoveries took off in the 1600s and onwards? Because in the 1600s, the Bible was translated into English and many other languages. And these scientists came into the scene with the understanding that it was created by a God on purpose, design, intelligence, and ordered reflecting God's character. They said, well, if it's created by a creator who cares and loving, then he must make rules. There must be rules in this world of science. So they made discoveries because they were creationists. And by the way, in case you didn't know, most of those people were not just creationists. They were young earth creationists. They believed the earth was young. Okay, so that should really mess with your head if you're thinking that you can't be a young earth creationist and do good science. These were. 
So the creationist worldview not only is scientifically sound, but can make scientific predictions. We'll come to that in just a minute. How could you be a creationist and make scientific predictions? I'm going to come to that in just a minute. But today, I'm not going to be talking about fossils or carbon radiometric dating or biology, universe and the stars. I want to mainly focus on geology. I'm going to show you in geology how the Bible is accurate to give you more confidence and equip you more. I want to mainly focus on that talk because if I get this right, if I explain to you how geology works, then the whole foundation of creation will be understood much better. Uh, at least it will be the basis of your foundation and it will remove an element that people have about the myth in Genesis 1 to 11. The myth in Genesis, I'm not kidding you, I don't want to embarrass you. Uh, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. How many people here at least came with the understanding that Genesis is a myth? Okay, there we go. So some of you have raised your hand, which is great. Thank you for your honesty. But I want to remove that understanding by showing you at least one part of it to be scientifically accurate, and hopefully the rest of it will follow. So today it's about geology. You see, basically, wherever you look, wherever you look, whichever rock you look at, you find something very interesting. You find layers in the rock, and you find fossils within them. Okay, so these are facts. Let me show you where they are. So the layers and the fossils exist, and they are a fact. But we're also told that the slow and gradual processes form these layers over millions of years. Agreed? That's what we're told all our lives. This is what happened all the time. And that the fossils found in these layers show evolution taking place from primitive to intelligent. So the primitive is at the bottom, and intelligent is at the top. Are we clear? Okay? I don't want to misrepresent anyone that that is the belief. So what do creationists say about this? What do they actually do? Do they, do they deny these layers or do they go around saying, no, there are no fossils in those layers and turn a blind eye and they say God did it? Is that what they're doing? Turns out that they're not denying the layers and they're not denying the fossils. Well, how do they get away with it then? What are they actually saying? How come they don't believe in millions of years of evolution? Remember, there are some people who mix the two together. You could be one of them. You say, in my mind, I've got it all clear because I'm mixing them together. Many good scientists don't believe in mixing the two together. That's because creationists say the layers happened during a global flood that covered the whole earth. All people, plants, land, and sky animals were buried quickly and that the whole process took just over a year. Now, if that's true, what would I expect to see in the rocks in the geologic history of the earth? What would I expect to see in there? Well, I would expect to see layers. Well, why would I expect to see layers? Well, there is a principle called hydrologic sorting, and there it is on the screen. And I just want to explain to you very quickly what hydrologic sorting is. Please remember this. This is really important, and it's good science. If you bring a glass of water and you put some dirt in it, shake it up really well, let it rest. After a while, it will sort itself into layers based on density, and it's based on size. Things like gravel, sand, silt, clay, and so on, they go and they form into layers. That's a fact. That, that, that is not something I have to convince you about. That's how you would get layers in the rock, literally. The global flood, which would have been a one massive hydrologic sorting process around the whole Earth, would have mixed the whole Earth and turned it upside down, creating layers in them. So loads of water messed up the whole Earth. That's basically the theory behind it, loads of water. But where did this water come from? So where did it come from? The Bible says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and it even covered the highest mountains. Now, listen, you don't have to be a genius to work this one out. If it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, you're not gonna create enough water to cover the highest mountain, like Mount Everest. Okay, so I'm with you. It's not gonna cover it. And also, the heat generated by that much rain will be inconceivable. You see, what happens is to make water into vapor, you have to put heat into it. And when it condenses back into water, it releases heat. Now, I know you don't feel heat when it's raining because it comes on you and you feel the coolness of the rain. But when it happens in such large quantity, the heat generated would cook the earth. So, 40 days and 40 nights is not enough to create enough water to cover the mountains and it will generate so much heat, the world will just collapse. It will melt. So, how do they answer the question? Well, the problem is in the argument. The problem is that it makes two assumptions. Assumption number one, it makes the assumption that Mount Everest existed during the global flood. Creationists say Mount Everest didn't exist during the global flood. The geologic change that caused Mount Everest to exist happened during the global flood. 
And the second problem with the argument is that Genesis 7:11 says, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Aha, so that's where the water came from. It came from another source, the fountains of the great deep. Not just some, but all the fountains of the great deep were broken. There is your key right there. So the water came from under the crust of the earth, which cracked the earth like an eggshell all the way around. And water came bursting out from the great deep, from the crust of the earth, all opened up on one day. That's what the Bible says. And on top of that, this event went on for 150 days, rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but the water kept rising for 150 days, and that they were on the ark for just over a year. So a quick summary. There were no high mountains, effectively just hills. Majority of the water came from under the crust of the earth. The water kept increasing for 150 days. They were on the ark for just over a year. Okay, so not all the water came from the rain. It came from under the crust of the earth. So let's examine this scientifically now. Okay, so you're into science. You really need to pay attention. If the hydrologic sorting happened on earth, then I would expect to see layers in the rock. So the hydrologic sorting will cause the layers in the rock, just as I would have if the dirt was put in the glass of water, shake it, let it rest, and the layers will occur, just like that. Well, that's exactly what we see. We have the name for this. In fact, this is so common, we have a name for this, and it's called sedimentary layers. On top of that, I would expect to see these layers to be flat like pancakes. I would expect to see no erosion between the layers because they're not millions of years old. Nor would I expect to see soil layers between those layers. Consequently, I would expect anyone to believe in the would millions of years would look at one of those and say something like this. Did millions of years fly by with no discerning effect? I didn't make those statements. It came from scientists and I kept, could have kept you all day here telling you what they say that confuses the theory with the facts. I didn't want to do that because it'll bore you. It won't make sense without the global flood. And that's good for you, okay? It shouldn't worry you. It's good. Turns out the Bible was maybe right. Maybe it was right about what it said. Well, if the Bible is true, then the earth crust must have cracked open and the water rushed from under the crust of the earth. And it should have mainly happened where the seawaters were gathered. Here's a beautiful animation made by the BBC. And the second half was made by another scientist called Dr. Walt Brown. Let me talk you through it as you look at this. This shows a big split or a ridge in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is about 46,000 miles long. It wrapped around the Earth on primarily a great circle path. A big split like this could have caused big continental plates to drift apart. Well, is this a coincidence that most of the ridge happened in the ocean? Well, not for a creationist it wouldn't be. That's where the water came from. The fountain of the deep could have been burst open, causing cataclysmic events, shaping our continents, mountains, and geologic features we see today. All happened within a short time uh, during the global flood. The continent plates collide and pushed against each other, causing them to buckle and fold, forming mountains. We're told these things take millions of years, but one catastrophe can affect these things in a short time. Something major like the global flood could have caused something like this. In fact, it's only if done in a short time like this can we explain features like folding. Now pay attention what folding is. This is what folding looks like. Here's an example of mountains that are bent or folded. You see, if these things happened, whilst it's not soft, it will have cracks and fractures all around the folding. Well, we don't get any fractures and cracks around them. According to evolutionist scientists, their explanation for this is this. The conventional explanation is that under the pressure and heat of burial, the hardened sandstone and limestone layers were bent so slowly that they behaved as though they were plastic and thus did not break. So they're not denying the fact that it's bent without cracks. They're just saying that's the explanation for it. Well, according to this scientist, he says, but pressure and heat would have caused detectable changes in the minerals of these rocks, telltale signs, or metamorphism. So in other words, such pressure would change the rock to a different type of rock and become no longer sedimentary layers. You say, if that happened, that's the consequence of happening. It goes on to say, but such metamorphic minerals or pre-crystallizations due to such plastic behavior is not observed in the rocks. So in other words, they're still sedimentary layers. 
The sandstone, the limestone in the folds are the same as the sedimentary layers found in other places. A better explanation for the folds would be that it all happened early during the year of the global cataclysmic Genesis flood. It makes much more sense there. Now, if people don't want to believe that, that is okay. I'll tell you in a minute why they believe that. But if they don't want, that's fine. The sediments are laid, and whilst they are still soft, they buckled and folded and were caused to bend quickly. That's the creationist worldview. That's what creationists say happened for those layers to exist and for them to be bent like that. And I don't know how many people knew this. If you knew this already, raise your hand. If you knew that creationists already knew this, raise your hand. It's important that this is released and everybody knows what creationists are saying. You're going to find out some very interesting facts in a minute that's going to blow your mind, hopefully. In fact, if the global flood really did happen, I would expect that these matching layers will be found all over the world. Okay, so I'm making a claim now because I just said the global flood was worldwide. Therefore, I should see layers all over the... You see what I'm doing here? I'm making a prediction, a scientific prediction. It should be everywhere. Okay? So look at this example. The Cretaceous chalk beds of southern England, we're picking on England, are well known because they appear as spectacular white cliffs along the coast. These chalk beds can be traced westward across England and appear again in Northern Ireland in the opposite direction. These same chalk beds can be traced across France, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, Southern Scandinavia, and other parts of Europe to Turkey, then to Israel and Egypt in the Middle East, and even as far as Kazakhstan. I mean, come on. These were global, global structures that were all over the place. Not only that, but these chalk beds had the same fossils and they had distinctive layers above and below them and which are also found in these places. Midwest USA, from Nebraska in the north to Texas in the south. They also appear in the Perth Basin of Western Australia. These layers are stretched and they are massive, absolutely, and consistent with the global flood. I'd even go as far as saying that the coal beds in the northern hemisphere, the upper Carboniferous uh, Pennsylvanian and coal beds of eastern and midwest USA are the same coal beds and the same plant fossils as those in Britain and Europe. They stretch halfway around the globe from Texas to Donuts Basins, north of Caspian Sea and the former USSR. And the same Permian coal beds are found in Australia, Antarctica, India, South Africa, and even South America. These beds show the same kind of fossils across the whole region, with the exception of Pennsylvanian coal beds. It is so long stretch, it's incredible. Now, honestly, I could have bored you to death with this geology stuff. I, I know you're not all geologists here, but you need to know this stuff. And if you're a student, you need to know this stuff. You really need to. It can only make sense in a global flood model. It makes matters worse when you consider this. We're told that coal layers are older than nearly 300 million years ago. This is way before mankind supposedly came into the scene, right? I'm going to give you a reference for that. You see, in 2015, this is this year, we we're told that the oldest human we have discovered was in Ethiopia 2.8 million years ago. Incidentally, all they found was a few teeth. That's a pretty big, strong claim to make with a few teeth, but let's go with that. This is really important because uh, you, this, this should shock you if not surprise you. If coal is approximately 3 million years old or older, we shouldn't find relatively modern arts in coal. Do you agree? If you dig a coal and you find something modern, it should shock you because it's 300 million years old and mankind came into the scene 2.8 million years ago. Are we okay with this? Does that make sense? Good. Well, have a look at this. So we should not find iron pots embedded in coal or a shoe sole embedded in coal, a gold chain, iron thimble, drill bit or borer, coins, cuboid-shaped tool, curved stone plate bearing the image of a man's face. All of these are found in coal seams. They don't announce this because it contradicts the evolutionary worldview. And listen, you might stand here and you say, John, you made that up. I bet you they just found a few. That's all it is. So calm down. Okay. Well, in fact, they have so many of those findings, they have a special name for them. It's called out of place artifacts. Oop art. There you go. Oop art means out of place artifacts. So next time you go to your friends and you say, what about those oop arts in the cold seams? And they will think you are very intelligent. If you want more information about this, you can get this book with nearly a thousand pages of these old parks. 
right at the back, you can get them and you can find abbreviated version of that. These books are full of those findings. So it wasn't the odd one out they found. It's covered, absolutely covered. I want to encourage you to check this out. This is really important. If you want to defend your faith scientifically, there it is right there. Stand there firmly. I do debates with biologists. I've spoken to biologists in person. I'm not kidding you. The debate doesn't last very long. It doesn't. Because when you bring facts like that, they say, oh, I don't know. Oh, man, you got me. I have no idea. Well, maybe the Bible was right. Maybe that is the real answer. So clearly, these layers were buried during the global flood around about 4,400 years ago, if the Bible is true. If this doesn't puzzle you, then how about petrified trees going through several layers at the same time, including layers of coal? They're called, they got a name for it, it's called polystrata tree. That means it goes through many layers at the same time. As you know, trees don't live for millions of years. They will rot well before millions of years. So how do they appear through all the layers petrified in one go? Because it wouldn't go through it, would it? Because these layers took millions of years to go through it. The best explanation I've heard an evolutionist come up with to give the answer for petrified trees that went through layers, the best explanation I've heard for this is this, that all these trees were actually grown inside the layers. They were, they were grown inside the layers and therefore they went right through it. But here's the problem with those theory and you need to know the answers to those because here are the facts. And the facts are these trees have their roots broken off so they couldn't have grown in there. You can't have a tree without roots. So obviously they didn't grow there. These trees have few branches and hardly any bark. Some trees extend into layers of trees above them. And they're also not fallen trees, no trees buried in place because fallen trees in forests are found laying in all directions. However, in the petrified forest, trees that are lying down tend to be aligned in one direction. Even those trees that are upright have their long axis aligned the same direction. This is totally consistent with the transport model, but not inconsistent with the buried in place model. What we're saying is that if you have a global flood and the trees are being drifted, turned, they're, they're losing their bark, some of the branches are breaking off, they get buried, they get petrified, that works. But they doesn't work if they just fall off and they got buried. The other most fascinating discovery is that apparently some trees were found upside down inside those layers. I don't know if you know this, but trees don't grow upside down. It makes much more sense if the trees got uprooted during the global flood they rolled around a bit, lost their bark, and then buried quickly. It makes sense in the global flood model, but it doesn't make sense in the evolutionary model. I don't know if you're getting this, but if you present somebody with a fact like this, I want to see their faces. I want to see the face of the person you're going to talk to and say, hey, listen, um, these are the facts, so how are we going to fit them in in the evolutionary worldview? Uh, but it really works for me because it fits in my global flood worldview. So how are you going to answer that? How are you going to deal with that? So I'm trying to equip you at the same time as encourage you. You see, if we're trying to say that God's word has got to be upheld, then God couldn't have got something wrong. But if he did, then you really are in trouble. Now, sadly, because of lack of time, I'm not going to be able to answer this question. This is really interesting. So if you're writing notes down, ask me this question later, because I really want to answer it. Here's the question. Could that much water come from the crust of the earth? Really? Under the crust of the earth, water comes out, covers the whole earth? Whoa, could that really happen? So please do ask me that question. And where did it go? Where did the water go? It covered the whole earth? And then what happened to the water? Please ask that question. Can the earth really hold all that water? And can it really go somewhere? Where did it go? Now I'm gonna to get to the bottom of why we say all the things that we say. So the idea that the layers in the rock represented millions of years is relatively a new idea. Did you know that? This was a new invention. It wasn't something old. This is something new, we said. They didn't always think this. These layers used to represent God's wrath and judgment on mankind all the time. In the history of man, there was not a time when we never looked at it that way, except for now. Well, what happened? This was changed in the 1830s by a guy called Charles Lyell. Let me emphasize that Charles Lyell was primarily a lawyer. He wasn't a geologist, nor was he a scientist. He was interested in geology, but he was not a scientist. He was a lawyer. He couldn't stand the fact that these layers in the rock represented God's anger on humanity. So he wanted to change it. So he, in the 1830s, he wrote a very famous book called Principle of Geology and changed the meaning of all these layers ever since to mean millions of years. 
he made it up. His book's still in use today, and whenever I'm debating with somebody, that is what comes out, and it's very frustrating. We're littered with this teaching all over the place, absolutely everywhere. You would think that the book is all about science, right? That's what you would think. Well, <laughs> it was more religious than you think. He's got quotes after quotes attacking the Bible and mocking those who believe in it, in a book that's supposed to be a scientific book. Look at this one here. He reasoned philosophically against those who regarded the disordered state of the earth crust as exhibiting signs of the wrath of God for the sins of man. So he's acknowledging that the layers have always represented God's wrath. He criticized believers and spoke of himself as superior and that believers were blinded by scripture. That's what he said. In fact, Charles Lyell said that its goal was to free the science from Moses. So that was his goal, and he's openly said it. He managed to fool everybody to think that these layers are nothing to do with the global flood, sin, or God's wrath on mankind. It was an anti-biblical book disguised as a scientific book fooling people even today. That's where it came from all along. So Charles Darwin, who was trained to be a minister. Now, listen, I really need to point this out. Charles Darwin was trained to be a minister, which means that we call him today the greatest scientist who's ever lived. His knowledge of science was no better than the average minister of today's society. So he wasn't a scientist, he was a minister. That's what he was trained in. Took his book to the HMS Beagle Voyage and lasted five years. He read the book, came out doubting the Bible, and he lost his faith. And the rest is, of course, history. Until then, people believed that the earth was young and that the layers happened by the global flood. You see what I'm saying here? This is all recent. This is all very recent. So single-handedly, our dear friend Charles Lyell brainwashed people all the way from that time to today. If the layers happened quickly by the global flood, then the layers don't represent millions of years, if that's logically to follow. If it happened quickly, it doesn't represent millions of years. And that the fossils in them don't represent evolution of species. Can you be a creationist and come up with good scientific predictions? Can you really do that? Well, let me shock you with a few examples and then I'll uh, open for questions. Here's the big question. What scientific predictions can you do as a creationist? Well, let me start with this one. Just about everyone agrees that coal and oil came from living things. Oil comes from organisms that once lived and coal came from plants. We all agree with this. According to BP, our evolutionary model here, organic matter gradually changed into oil. The process takes at least a million years. Pretty much established that fossil fuel formed the fossilized remains of dead plants by exposure to heat and pressure in the earth crust over millions of years. Is it reasonable for me to assume that all of this happened quickly? Can I do that based on the model of the global flood? That means it happened over a short period of time. They're saying it takes millions of years, and I'm saying it happened over a short period of time. Well, the Argonne National Lab has shown that coal can form in just 36 weeks. Robert Gentry, who is a nuclear physicist, a very famous nuclear physicist, a young earth creationist, said that um, he produced coal from a piece of wood within a few weeks. George Hill, who is an American chemist and world authority on coal, said coal can form in a few hours. Well, the creationists not only can predict this, but have got good reasons to become up, come up with this conclusion. What about oil? As a creationist, I must expect that oil happened very quickly. So look at this one. Oil can be made in 20 minutes. It's done in 1971 in the laboratory. They got a plant that changed sewage sludge into oil in 30 minutes. So don't let them tell you it takes millions of years if they can make them in a few minutes. In fact, oil is being formed in rocks today very quickly, and we've acknowledged that. Here it is. The oil is being formed from the unusual rapid breakdown of organic debris by extraordinary extensive heat flowing through the sediments. It goes on to say, ordinarily, oil has been thought to form over millions of years, whereas in this, in this instance, the process is probably occurring in thousands of years. So if oil can form in rocks today quickly, well, maybe it formed quickly in the past. Uh, to me, that sounds like a reasonable conclusion to come to. You see, if you believe in the Bible, you can make those predictions, and you can come up with reasons why coal and oil can form in such a short time. It's easy to come to that conclusion, is what I'm saying. Okay, so evolutionists say diamonds take billions of years to form. Do we agree with that? I mean, come on, you can't, you can't not have seen this one. Diamonds take billions of years to form. That's what they tell us. Okay, so if I'm a creationist, I'm going to have to say it can happen in a few months. Wouldn't I? And I'm in trouble if I didn't say that, because then I'm disagreeing with my own theory. Well, if I made that claim as a creationist, it has to be yes. 
Diamonds can be done in a few months. If I'm an evolutionist, I'm going to say no. It's going to have to be done in billions of years. Check this out. Here's a company that's making diamonds for a living called LifeGem UK from your loved ones. I did not say for your loved ones. I said from your loved ones. It says here, a certified high quality diamond created from a lock of hair or the cremated ashes of your loved one as a memorial to their unique life. Well, how are they doing this? I thought it takes billions of years to make diamonds. And frequently asked questions, it says, what is the process used to make a life gem? The answer is, life gem unique technology replicates the process of what takes millions of years naturally to occur within the earth and speeds it up to create certified high quality diamonds in just a matter of months. But how do they do that if it takes millions of years? How can they make it in a few months? Not only that, but check the quality of these diamonds. Other than being created in our lab, life gem diamonds are molecularly identical to natural occurring diamonds. They possess the exact same traits, hardness, brilliance, fire, and luster. Why do they tell us that it takes billions of years to get diamonds when they obviously happen within a few months under the right conditions? Now, please tell me which is science and which is belief. If I'm a creationist, am I not likely to say that diamonds can happen quickly and therefore go out of my way trying to create one? Maybe this is what happened. This is my theory. God created the world just as he said. There was a global flood 4,400 years ago, just as the Bible said. And all these things were buried very quickly, just like the Bible said. That's my theory. And coal oil and diamonds were formed very quickly in just a matter of days, years, decades, maybe even centuries, but it happened relatively quickly. I can do similar healthy, useful predictions in every other field, whether it's geology, whether it's paleontology, biology, and astronomy. I can do that all day long. I can show you all day long how this is right. It's interesting to see that the atheist will climb the mountain of knowledge, and when they get there, they will find the creationist already sitting there waiting for them. Isn't that interesting? They meet with the creationist right at the top because they come to the same conclusion ultimately. And I'm closing now. I want you to think about this. Every time you see these layers in the rock and the fossils in those layers, every time you go and visit the Grand Canyon and you see those layers, and every time you look at a beautiful diamond, and every time you use coal to heat your home, and every time you fill up fuel in your car, it should remind you of God's wrath how he demonstrated his anger towards sin. Because God cannot tolerate sin, and he is not to be messed with. You see, in fact, God commands all men everywhere to repent. God is not asking you to repent. He's commanding you to repent. He's not even requesting. He's not wishing you to repent. He commands all men everywhere to repent because he appointed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. You see, he's angry at sin, and he promised that he will destroy it wherever it's found. But... Not only God is angry at sin, but he's also a loving God, so he found a way out for us. He gave us a way. He's full of passion. So what did he do? He came down himself and paid for the fine that we should be paying for, so that on the day of judgment, when you appear before God in his courtroom, he can dismiss your case on grounds that another person paid for your fine. If you appear before a judge and you're fully guilty, he can let you go if somebody pays your fine. And that's what God has done for you. In his mercy, he came down and he paid for that. And you need to know something here. When you make it to heaven, I said when, not if. Because you don't get to heaven because you're good. It's not because of something you have done. You get to heaven because of what he did for you. He paid for your fine so that you can enter into his kingdom. Otherwise, you are guilty. But he washes you white as snow. That's what happens when God pays your fine. You are white as snow. He covers you with his righteousness. So if you repent today and you put your faith in Jesus, you will be saved. So can a Christian be a creationist and be scientific or do scientific predictions? I would say yes. As a creationist, you have good reasons to believe in certain things like the laws of physics. As a creationist, you have good reasons to believe in things like uniformity of nature, different subject. As a creationist, you have reasons to believe in the laws of logic. You see, you have good reasons to believe in all of those things because the world was created by a loving God who created it with purpose, who created it with meaning, and who created it with intelligence. Therefore, you can have purpose, you can have meaning, and you can have intelligence. Now, I feel I have to thank you right now for being patient with me. So first of all, give yourself a round of applause for being so patient. Thank you. So now... Um, I think I've got like five or ten minutes worth of question time you can ask.